Hello and welcome everybody to our talk for this year's uh, regional conference on permafrost. And I would like to uh, give you my talk uh, about a recent study that uh, might be published already, but at the moment, as of today, is um, accepted. Um, it's, a, it's on evaluating a deep learning approach for mapping retrogressive thaw slumps across the Arctic. I'm Ingmar Nitze from the Alfred Wegener Institute. And in this study there, I would like to thank my colleagues, Konrad Heidler, Sofia Barth, Alex Tagowitzka, and Guido Große for supporting me, especially Konrad, who did a lot of the coding work. Although we are at a permafrost conference and I'm pretty sure that you know what retrogressive thaw slumps is, I would still like you to, or like to give you a short introduction to them. So they're typically uh, erosion features, which we find especially in very ice-rich permafrost especially in formerly glaciated terrain and it's it's a typical mass wasting pro, uh, process which um, has strong implications on uh, local to regional um, aquatic ecology on hydrology on biogeochemical cycles and also um, you know the carbon cycle on its own we see some example here on the top left from the bikovsky peninsula which is a nice coastal thaw slump. And the second example uh, on the top is the Selawik slump, which my uh, Alaska colleagues yeah, pretty much notice uh, instantly. Um, they can be pretty dynamic and quite small. So they range from very small, just a few square meters, to up to about one square kil kilometers, which are kind of the mega slums which we find in Batagai or some other places um, in Northwestern Canada. The problem is they often remain undetected. So due to their scattered distribution and their small size in very remote areas, um, it's pretty hard to track them. So um, they're typically clustered. So we see big clusters in Northwestern Canada. Uh, at the ice marginal areas of the Laurentide ice sheet. So the Peel Plateau is, for example, um, quite prominent. Banks Island, Victoria Island. Um, in Alaska, not so much. Um, the Selawik Slump, Nortag region, um, the Brooks Range foothills. But there are also many, many, many under, unknown places in, in Russia and Siberia where we do have thaw slumps, but they are not thoroughly mapped. They can be pretty dynamic, as we see here on the bottom. So these are rapid eye images um, where I delineated uh, thaw slumps in 2016. This is on the Tymir Peninsula, which is also one hotspot, which is not very well known. And here we already see like how they expand over time. Due to their importance on local to regional scales and even even bigger scales if we count them all together it's quite important to study them how they are distributed how they change over time if they change with with the cl changing climate and uh, how their interactions are with the landscapes so far most studies are mostly local scale with high resolution data they're pretty accurate so it's mostly based on digitization and quite quite simple methods but that requires high manual effort and is kind of kind of limited to really small local areas so we don't really know the big picture on the other hand there are studies that focus on regional to continental scales but um, they typically have a lower accuracy due to the low spatial resolution so our target is to have a segmentation of retrogressive thaw slumps, so to get their footprints, to get polygons, uh, for example, or raster masks for them, and the combination of the good features. So we want to have accurate results with little manual effort, um, but on large spatial scales. Over the past years, there's been a lot of progress in image analysis and object detection, object segmentation, mostly in everyday imagery for um, detecting certain objects from photography like you see you see here on the left so this is a nice photo for me in the field and there are algorithms uh, based on deep learning or artificial intelligence which are 
looking for the entire image and the content of the entire image and not only on pixels which um, which we have done in the past uh, for for remote sensing imagery so here on this one you can nicely see there is a detection of a person of a backpack uh, and other features and over the past years this has been also implemented in um, remote sensing work and especially also in permafrost. Although in permafrost, we're a bit slow with adapting these new technologies, but there are certainly some, some studies who are kind of trying to leverage these capabilities of these um, deep learning methods. For example, Zhang et al. Uh, and the group around Chani Witharana who are um, working on, on mapping um, ice wedge polygons um, on very high resolution data um, with deep learning methods, or also Ling Cao Huang and colleagues who are mapping retrogressive thaw slams on the Tibetan plateau. Based on the successful application of these image analysis um, workflows and uh, image analysis um, algorithms, we set up a data processing pipeline which uses remote sensing input data, create a deep learning model which outputs um, retrogressive thaw slump footprints to have that automated and to um, analyze the data in the background. So we created a highly automated workflow, which takes care of the data management, of data processing, augmentation, which means um, adapting the training imagery to increase the training size, but also to introduce some noise, some rotation to better generalize uh, the, the, the model uh, and to have a more transferable and generalizable model. Um, the workflow also contains automated uh, model training and validation inference, which means then the final application of the model. So we put data into the model and receive um, footprints from yeah, also unknown areas to really apply the model over large regions. And all that is implemented in, in Python, based on PyTorch and many um, packages uh, which are working that. And the code is uh, on GitHub, so you will uh, have a link to that later on so that you can also use, um, use the code, improve it, and uh, create your own models, improve models, and uh, run the entire processing. To test our model and the application, we chose six regions across northwestern Canada and Russia, which are Kogriev Island in Lena River um, slums uh, in Russia, and Herschel Island, Taktoyakto Peninsula, the Horton Delta region, and Banks Island in northwestern Canada. We applied a regional cross validation where we trained the model on five regions and validated on a sixth one and rotated that through all regions and all uh, potential setups. As thaw slumps can look very differently depending on the sediment they are sitting in, uh, on vegetation which is around, if they are on a coastal setting, more in at valleys or on, on lakes, we try to incorporate all these different attributes that they can have. Now let's come to the data that we used. We used uh, mainly planet uh, surface reflectance scenes from 2018 and 2019. They have a spatial resolution of three meters. They contain four bands, which you see here uh, on panel A. So they are multispectral in blue, green, red, and near. Here on the bottom, you see an example of a false lump in the Horton region, which is pretty big um, in a color infrared image. Uh, on top of the um, multispectral data, so the four multispectral bands. We also calculated the normalized difference vegetation index as um, yeah, thaw slumps are pretty much characterized by bare soil surrounded by vegetation in many areas. We also used um, Landsat trend images um, from previous publications of me um, with a tassel cap uh, brightness, tassel cap greenness and tassel cap wetness trends over time. So that also contains a multi-temporal approach, which um, gives us information on the changes um, that happened over the past past years um, in that area. So here we nicely see in blue uh, actively eroding thaw slump areas. Uh, on top of that, we also used the Arctic Dam 
which is available for most regions across the Arctic. There are some gaps and holes here and there, which might cause some trouble, but overall they're um, covering most of the areas quite well. Uh, there we used uh, relative elevation, so a detrended elevation. On top of that, we calculate the slope um, in degrees, and we used a uh, Google Earth Engine for calculating all these um, all these values. In contrast to most standard deep learning algorithms, for example, Mask RCNN, which only takes one or three input bands, we are here able to use more bands. So we have a higher density of information and more variable information. So we can use a custom number of bands, in our case, nine. And of course, this is a supervised uh, classification uh, method. So we use uh, we need some kind of ground truth. So we created training data as polygons and delineated false lumps manually. For this study, we went through two iterations. So one person, one trained person, digitized them at the first time and then they went um, through a second person, which was mostly me, um, providing feedback um, and changing the polygons if necessary to have kind of a standardized way to have good ground truth. But still, it is sometimes tricky um, to really have a high quality input, uh, input uh, data as output data. We have uh, raster values. So we have the binary raster, so which means one for rich fast lump and zero for background values, but also the probability values. And uh, on top of the binary um, raster values, we also uh, provide vectors. So um, just the shape file, polygon shape files with the outline or the, the footprint of the retrogressive force lump. The output data have a resolution of three meters. And here in this um, table, you see the statistics. So we used over 200 images, way more than 1,000 digitized uh, false lumps, more than 200 images used. And the images are later even um, split into a lot of small tiles. On the next slide, you get some bit more technical insight into the model and how we used it. So we're trying to focus on the regional transferability. As we see, this is paramount for mapping false lumps across large regions in the Arctic. So therefore, we chose these six regions. Uh, we pro uh, proceeded with a six-fold cross-validation on a spatial basis. So we used five regions for training, one for validation, and rotated through all regions. Our workflow is so flexible that we can um, use different architectures, backbones, um, loss functions, etc. So it's easily configurable. So here we, for testing, we chose three um, quite um, successful architectures, which are UNET, UNET++, and DBLAB v3. There are a lot more, um, but this is more kind of for evaluation. We use different encoders based on ResNet, so ResNet 34, 50, 101. Um, and in total, um, we have, we performed 54 experiments. So uh, we iterated through all combinations. And for the best um, three regions, we also um, run a full training. So um, for running these experiments, we used a condensed data set. So we only use tiles which have inform which also contain false lumps. Uh, and for um, the full training uh, of the best models, and the best three regions, we added another 20 epochs. Um, for evaluating our models, we used accuracy for the overall accuracy. So this is a binary uh, classification slash segmentation. Um, and for class specific accuracies, we used uh, intersection over union, IOU, uh, F1 score, uh, and precision and recall to see the balance of the classification. Now let's switch to two detailed examples that we process. The upper one is uh, in the Horton Delta region, right by the coast, uh, just south of the Horton Delta in northwestern Canada. And on the bottom, we see uh, an example from the uh, Lena River slums, which are <clears throat> on the eastern banks of the Lena River, uh, about midway between Yakutsk and the Lena Delta. So here in the CV model example, we see the 
probabilities that this is a thaw slump by the cross-validated model. So these results here are completely independent and trained in the other regions and here the inference in that region. So for the model, this, uh, this area is unknown um, respectively. Um, the black outlines are the ground truth. So this is kind of uh, the outline or the footprint of the thaw slump and uh, the, the more intense uh, the color is red, the higher the confidence of the model that this is the thaw slump. So we see here in the upper model <clears throat> in the Horton region that there are some, some parts that are better classified and where the model says, okay, I'm pretty certain that this is the thaw slump. These are typically close to the head wall. Um, so here we already see um, that this area might be uh, favored and that the model is more certain. Uh, the same in the Lina example. So the bottom one is pretty simple. It classifies very well. And um, the bottom, the smaller, more um, longer slump, it's not perfectly, um, uh, perfectly uh, modeled, but still quite good. And for example, we also have the full model. So when that region is already known to the, to, the, to the model, so this is now a model, model that covers the entire, all six regions and is trained on all six regions. And there, um, if we have that in, trained in, in a certain region, then the model is pretty confident uh, for most areas and uh, for most locations. Our initial aim was to create transferable models so that we train in a certain subset and expand that uh, analysis to a large region and still get a good performance. So in this figure here, you see the classification performance for the different regions. On the left-hand side, you see the one uh, sorted by epochs. So the gradual improvement or gradual change of the model. And on the right-hand side, you see that sorted by the metrics, so from best to worst models. Here we have all the models in there per region, uh, be it architecture or encoders. So we have uh, a lot of statistics that go in here. Different colors, you see the, um, the regional sets. So um, the best three models, for example, are Horton, Lena and Kolguyev. So in that region, um, the the models perform quite well. In Herschel, they don't perform that well. And uh, in Banks Island and Taktoyaktuk, they are pretty bad. So we see large differences between the different models. And we see also that by the ranked one, where it's a bit easier to pick up the differences. We applied the same analysis, not for regions, but also for architectures, where UNET++ came out as the overall best architecture for mapping thaw slumps across different regions. The other two uh, architectures that we tested, UNET and DeepLab v3, performed quite similar. Okay, let's sum up this talk a little bit. So in this little project, we create an automated configurable deep learning workflow to map retrogressive thaw slumps. We use planet input data with three meters spatial resolution and other free data sources. And we were able to produce good results with kind of a variable transferability. So in some regions it worked well, in some it did. For upscaling our analysis to, to the Panarctic, which is kind of the ultimate goal, um, we need more training data and especially more standardized, da uh, standardized training data. So it showed that in the creation of these um, Trading data by digitization can be quite a tricky task. So there are no really standard protocols that we could follow. There could be user bias. How do we delineate a thaw slump? What, what is a thaw slump in general? So these are kind of important questions that need to be solved. Um, therefore, I would like to invite you for feedback and to kind of um, yeah, work on that together. Upscaling, of course, is the next step to do that for um, highly affected regions across the entire Arctic. And in the end, we would like to have a continuous monitoring and also model improvement. So the good thing is with uh, deep learning models, we can retrain them 
add new data, and then improve the models gradually. After the, even after the summary, we have a little bonus. So the methodology and the workflow is so much automated that we can also add other data. It doesn't have to be false lumps. So we can add any other other features where we already have data sets, for example, Pingos, which you see here on the left-hand side, um, where we see the Pingo probabilities overlaying on the Arctic Dam and the Northern Seward Peninsula, or um, to create water masks, which here trained uh, on the um, Pearl uh, water data set. And for future plans, we also um, working on adding multi-class um, capabilities that we can lump them all together in one model and have more flexible input data. At the moment, it's more or less hard-coded for the um, defined nine input layers and planet data. But um, yeah, adding, for example, Sentinel-2 data will will add even more value to the to the workflow as then we can really rely on uh, completely free data, which planet data are not. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attendance. And I would really like to hear back from you. Um, really feel free to share training data. I think that's the biggest lag that we have right now. Um, here we have a pretty automated workflow um, where we can incorporate these, uh, these training data easily. Um, you can contact me uh, the best via email or here on the conference. Um, you find um, the code of this study uh, on my GitHub repository and also the data. So there's a, a shapefile with, um, with vector data, uh, which we use for training and also some, some additional scripts for handling data. I thank you for your attendance and hope to meet you at the conference.